Naram Chaiva Narottamam Devim Sarasutim Yasam Tato Jaya Mudirayet Nashta Prayeshu Abhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Ruttama Shloke Bhakti Bhavati Naishtaki We are reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter number 3, Pure Devotional Service, Text number 22. Right? Yeah. Ani 
ननो रजा तो हरे यो Any 
any member of the family who is above 12 years of age should be initiated by a bona fide spiritual master and all the members of the household should be engaged in the deity service of the Lord beginning from morning 4 a.m. till night 10 p.m. by performing Mongol Arti Nir, Niranjana Archana Puja Kirtan Sringara Boga Boga Vaika Boga Vaikali Sandhya Aratika Pata Boga at night Shayana Artika, etc. Engagement in such worship of the deity under the direction of a bona fide spiritual master will greatly help the householders to purify their very existence and make rapid progress in spiritual knowledge. Simple theoretical book knowledge is not sufficient for a neophyte devotee. Book knowledge is theoretical, whereas the archana process is practical. Spiritual knowledge must be developed by a combination of theoretical and practical knowledge. And that is the guaranteed way for attainment of spiritual perfection. The training of devotional service for a neophyte devotee completely depends on the expert spiritual master who knows how to lead his disciple to make gradual progress towards the path back home, back to Godhead. One should, one should not become a pseudo-spiritual master as a matter of business to meet one's family expenditure. One must be an expert spiritual master to deliver the disciple from the clutches of impending death. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti has defined the bona fide qualities of a spiritual master and one of the verses in the description reads Sri Vigraha Radhana Nityanana Sringar Tanmandira Marjanado Yuktasya Bhaktas Cha Niranjatopi Bande Guru Sri Charana Ravinda Sri Vigraha is the archa or suitable worshipful form of the Lord and the disciple should be engaged in worshipping the deity regularly by Sringara by proper decoration and dressing as also by Mandira marginal, the matter of cleansing the temple. The spiritual master teaches the neophyte devotee all these kindly and personally to help him gradually in the realization of the transcendental name, quality, form, etc. of the Lord. Only only attention engaged in the service of the Lord, especially in dressing and decorating the temple, accompanied by musical kirtan and spiritual instructions from scriptures, can save the common man from the hellish cinema attractions and rubbish songs broadcast everywhere by radios. If one is unable to maintain a temple at home, 
he should go to another's temple where all the above performances are regularly executed. Visiting the temple of a devotee and looking at the profusely decorated forms of the Lord, well dressed in a well decorated sanctified temple, naturally infused the mundane mind with spiritual inspiration. People should visit holy places like Vrindavan where such temples and worship of the deity are specifically maintained. Formerly, all rich men, like kings and rich merchants, constructed such temples under the direction of expert devotees of the Lord, like the six Goswamis. And it is the duty of the common man to take advantage of these temples and festivals observed at the holy places of pilgrimage by following in the footsteps of great devotees, Anubraja. One should not visit all these sanctified pilgrimage places and temples with sightseeing in mind. But one must go to such temples and sanctified places, immortalized by the transcendental pastimes of the Lord, and be guided by proper men who know the signs. This is called Anubraja. Anu means to follow. It is therefore best to follow the instruction of the bona fide spiritual master, even in visiting temples and the holy places of pilgrimage. One who does not move in that way is as good as a standing tree condemned by the Lord not to move. The non-moving tendency of the human being is misused by visiting places for sightseeing. The best purpose of such traveling tendencies could be fulfilled by visiting the holy places established by great acharyas and thereby not being misled by the atheistic propaganda of money-making men who have no knowledge of spiritual matters. Translation again. The eyes which do not look at the symbolic representations of the personality of Godhead, his form, name, quality, etc., are like those printed on the plumes of the peacock and the legs which do not move to the holy places where the Lord is remembered are considered to be like those of tree trunks. Bancha Kaupa Tarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhaye Bhacha Patita Nam Pavane Vyo Vaishna Vidyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adraita Gadadha Shri Vasari Gorvata Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare so we're hearing from Shonaka Rishi. Shonaka is leading the sages in Naimasharanya forest and they're inquiring from Sutta Goswami. 
So Shonika is speaking very strongly against those people who are against the devotional service of the Lord. He's saying, what is the use of eyes which do not look on the form of the personality of Godhead? If we do not use our eyes to look at the form of the Lord, then our eyes are like the eyes of the peacock. The, rather, the, the eyes printed on the plumes of the peacock. You know, on the, the plumes of the uh, peacock feather, they have eyes printed there. So these eyes, of course, cannot see anything. So in the same way, if we do not use our eyes, to see the form of the Lord, then our eyes are useless. And then he mentions also, if we do not use our legs to go to the holy places, then our legs are like those of the tree trunk. The tree trunks, they're not moving anywhere. In the same way, if we don't use our legs to go to the holy places, then our legs are also useless. They're serving no purpose at all. So, Srila Prabhupada describes how it's a duty of people who are in household life that they should have the deity in their home. And if they don't have the deity in their home, then they should go to temple. Go to the temple and see the deity in the temple. So that way, then we make proper use of the eyes. And Sri Prabhupada describes how when you have the deity, you have different duties to perform, different aunties to perform. Just like he mentions how we should, people, if they have the deity, you're meant to worship the deity from morning till night, from four o'clock in the morning until ten o'clock at night. So in the morning, you're meant to do mango arti, perform the, the mango arti, and then after, of course, after doing the Mangal Arti, then they have to regularly bathe the deity and change the dress of the deity. And then you have to offer more foodstuffs to the deity. Just like in temples, they will do offerings throughout the day. In the Standard temples, they will offer six, six or seven times a day. So for most people, it, it's very difficult, to, of course, to perform so much kind of worship. And then you have to offer the Raj bowl in the middle of the day, and that will be, you know, an elaborate offering. We will offer many different preparations and then fruit in the afternoon, and then in the evening, then offer savouries again. And throughout the day also sweets are offered with each of the offerings. And then in the evening, then they change the dress of the deity. So they have the day dress and then the night dress. So the they do like this in the standard temples. So this way throughout the day, the devotees are busy engaged in the worship of the deity. There are so many services to be done. Uh, making clothes for the deity is also an elaborate affair. And then making garlands for the deity every day to make flower garlands. It's quite a lot of seva 
required. In temples like in Kuala Lumpur, they have a rotor and different ladies are assigned with the, the flower service to make the garlands and to make vases also. We like to put some flower vases on the altar to decorate the altar. Decorating the altar is also a part of the deity worship and generally we will make nice flower vases to put on the altar. So that requires time also. You have to put, you, know, you can't put the flowers there for many days, one, you know, a few days. And then after a few days, then the flowers dry up or they wither. You have to change, you have to regularly change the flowers and put fresh water and so on. So in this way, serving the deity is a big service. There's a lot of people required, a lot of work. When they have festivals, like Gaur Purnima is coming, so the deity should have new dress. The deities will have a new dress at Gaur Purnima and then Janmastami. There will be a new dress also at Janmastami. So two or three times in the year, the deity will get new dresses, new outfits. So this all has to be arranged, organized. You have dresses made. Of course, nowadays people get the dresses from Vrindavan or Mayapur or Mumbai, they get them made for them. But some temples, they will make their own dresses. Not every temple has the, enough money to make, to, to purchase. And many places, they will make their own dresses for the deities. So decorating the temple also, we put flowers and uh, flower vases and then string like here we have met some mango oh, earlier there were mango leaves and like this kind of decoration you cut the uh, what is it cut the leaves like this hmm? like this is all decorating the temple you see all of these things so this is all required and decoration and then also cleansing. So Prabhupada quotes the verse which we sing every morning, Sri Vigraha Radhanan Sri Garatan Mandira Marjanado Mandira Marjanado. So clean, cleaning the temple, that is also required. Uh, just like in Vrindavan or Mayapur, they have marble on the floor. They have marble on the floor. So Prabhupada said every day if you want to wash the marble, and that way it will shine. You don't have to polish it or anything, just wash it with water every day and then it starts to shine. So in, in Mayapur, Vrindavan, in these big temples, every day they will wash the whole temple floor. And of course they have devotees assigned to do all these things. But people also come to the temple and they like to do service. So we get them to do things, give them the brush and they can sweep the temple. <coughs> So cleaning the temple is also devotional service and it's also important and cleaning the temple and then also in the temple there has to be also kata, there has to be regular kata because people who come to the temple they should be given the opportunity to hear from the scriptures. We don't just go to the temple to ring the bell and break the coconut. You know, that's, that's okay, but we've got to also hear about what's in the temple and why you're coming to the temple. 
And actually we come to the temple to be seen, not to see, Prabhupada saying, uh, it's not for sight seeing, but we come to be seen, that the deity can see. The deity is Krishna and the deity eats, just like we cook and we offer the food to the deity, the deity is eating. So the deity is not only eating, but the deity is also hearing and he's also seeing. So he wants to see who's coming to worship him, he wants to hear also. Krishna takes pleasure in hearing Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam and hearing the Katha. When Ramnami comes, we like to speak on Ramayana. Now, one of the devotees, uh, uh, this one devotee, Vidvan Baranga, he has translated the Valmiki Ramayana, verse by verse. Very nice. When you go to India, maybe you can get the, the it's not all printed, it's many volumes, but a number of volumes have come out, and it's no. very, very good reading. No. Huh? No. No, it's yeah, it's a it's comfortable. Yeah. So they they printed this uh, Valmiki Ramayana, very nice reading, and then you can recite, you can read it. So we need to hear, and people come to the temple, they need to hear. So Prabhupada mentions, come to the temple, go to the holy places. It's not just for an eye exercise. It's not just to exercise the eyes, but it's more for exercising the ears, to hear. We have to hear. We come to the holy place, we go to holy places to hear from the devotees who live there. So that's important for us. If we don't hear, then we heard Sonika Rishi said, our ears are like what? Snake holes. The, the holes of the snake, right? We don't hear, our ears are like the holes of the snake. And if we don't chant, then our tongue is like? Frog. Like the frog's tongue, right? right. So these examples are given very instructive examples. And then also, uh, the upper portion of the body, if we don't bow before the Lord, then? Even if you have a turban on your head, you may have a nice turban on your head, but if you don't bow your head before the Lord, then? The head is simply a heavy burden, just a heavy burden, your turban, you're waiting on people put on the turban and have a nice turban, but it's simply a heavy burden if you don't use it to bow before the Lord. So like this Shonika Rishi is describing how to use the different parts of our body for the service of the Lord. And he's condemning people who don't use these different bodily organs in the service of the Lord. And going to the holy places. Sometimes people go to the holy places and they just go to shop. They just go for shopping. <laughs> they go and buy this, go to the market and go around Lloyd Bazaar and purchase this and that, and they never hear, they never take time to sit and hear and to chant, or that hardly even they go to see the deities. They say, oh, it was very crowded, <laughs> so we didn't go. <laughs> Sometimes it is very crowded, but that's part of going to the holy place. You have to accept there will be some inconvenience. We go to the holy places. You can't expect that it will be so easy. There will be difficulties. 
But still, we take advantage to go to the holy places, we should go to see, go to the deities, go to the temples and let Krishna see us, show ourselves to Krishna. But we want to, we want to see the deity also. So this way, deity worship is an elaborate thing. We encourage people, be careful about installing deities. Especially worship of Radha and Krishna, you have to be more serious and more strict in following the rules and regulations. The worship of Gornitai is more merciful. Gornitai are very proud, but said Gornitai can be worshipped simply by Kirtan. Just by doing Kirtan, you can worship the deity of Gornitai. So they are very, very merciful, right? Sometimes we sing the song, Parama Karuna Pahudvi Jana Nitai Gora Chandra. That of that these two words are very, very merciful. Sabha Avatara Sarasiromani Kevala Ananda Kanda. They have given a process which is very joyful. Of all of Krishna's incarnations, these two forms of Chaitanya and Nityananda are supremely merciful. But if you worship other deities, you have to be like Shaligram. Now if you have a Shaligram and you're doing Shaligram puja every day, you have to do it every day. And you don't eat until after you've done your Shaligram Puja. Every day you have to do it. So that's customary in Brahmanas who have the Shaligram, who's doing the Puja. They must do the Puja first and then only they will take food. And of course they have to bathe. You're going to worship the deity. You have to be clean. You have to be clean. You have to bathe in the morning. You have to put tea like on the body. The walk cloth should be fresh, freshly washed. And the woman also cannot worship the deity if they are contaminated. If they are in the contamination period, then they cannot worship the deity. So that is cleanliness. And so we, we follow these principles in the temples. And People who have deities at home, they should be careful about these things. They have to be careful to, that they bring the deity to their home, so they have to, they have to recognize certain things. Of course, we, we tell people that you have to know what standard you're going to follow. And you don't, don't try to do too much. You know, in a temple, how we do it in the temple is going to be different from how you do at home. How you do at home, you know, you're not going to be able to do so much. You're not going to be able to make so many offerings. And anyway, uh, when you bring the deity there to your home, you have to recognize that the deity has come to your home. The, the home becomes a deity's home. And we're simply there as a servant of the deity. Even if you go to Jaipur, the deity of Govinda Ji there is in Jaipur. And the deity, the deity is the king. And the king is the servant of the deity, the Maharaja. He is there residing in Jaipur as the servant of Krishna. So like that, you bring the deity to your home, the deity is the proprietor, and you're there as the servant of the deity. So it's important that once the deity comes, then the service has to continue. 
Sometimes people, they get deities, and then after some time they decide, oh, I don't think I want this deity, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And they, they, they give the deity away. Find somebody to take the deity, you know. And you can see in Vrindavan even, there are deities like, there's one temple and there will be three or four different deities because they brought the other deities there. Originally the temple was for one deity, but they brought other deities there. They, did, they didn't want their deities, so people brought their deities and put them in that other temple. So that that temple will continue the worship. So that's not very good. Shouldn't be like that. Once you bring, Prabhupada said, once we open a temple, cannot close. Right? Once the temple is open, you cannot close. Just like we've opened the temple here. Temple cannot close. Has to continue. But to continue, people have to continue, meaning people have to do the worship. The worship has to go on. So it's a responsibility. So nowadays in ISKCON, they have a thing called the deity ministry. And before people can install a deity in any temple, they have to get authorization. And the, the deity ministry will come and they want to know how many brahmanas have you got? Because in order to worship the deity, they have to have a number of brahmanas to do the puja, to keep the, the worship going. And they want to know, is it your property? The, where you're worshipping the deity, is it your own property? You're just renting? But after some time, maybe you have to leave. Where's the deity going to go? You're going to put a deity there in the house and then they'll, they'll, then they'll tell you get out. We want, we're want we going to sell this house and you don't have the money to buy the house. You have to move the deity. So that's a problem. The deity has no home. The deity loses the place to reside. So, so the deity ministry, they check all of these things. They make sure that they can continue, that if they bring the deities, they make sure that the deity worship will continue, that it will go on once it begins. Just like in the family, sometimes you know, a couple begin to worship the deity, but then if their children are not interested to worship the deity, then it's a problem, and that happened. That's, that's in history. Some deities were worshipped in the home by some king. The king was a devotee and the king was arranging the puja. Then the king died and the king's son said, Oh, I don't want to do this anymore. We're not going to do this. And they, they want to sell the deity. You know, I'm spending so much money for the deity worship. Better I'll just sell the deity, I'll get some money. And they do like that. They want to sell the deity. They give it. So, this is not, not good, but it happens. And so, we're more cautious nowadays about having deities and installing deities, because when you install, you know, you have, you have to continue the deity, the worship. It has to go on. It's very important. Okay, any question? Guru Maharaj, installing means uh, Pranadhista, right? What? Installing deities means Pranadhista and Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Okay, normally we bring the house, we don't do Pranadhista, we have to just do the normal prayer. So is it very important? Of course, in a house, it can be simpler. It's up to everybody. But some some people, some devotees, they they want to install the deity. They want to have the deity installed, and they will do some pranpratista. 
But of course, it's not like in a big temple. When they open a, a big temple, then they will do the full thing. Usually, what we do is just kirtan and puja and uh, invite devotees to all come and like that, make a feast and have a big kirtan. Srila Prabhupada said, actually, the real installation of the deity is done by the chanting of the holy name, by kirtan. It's not really the pranapratista ceremony so much as the kirtan which brings Krishna. So Prabhupada said, we can do the pranapratista because if we don't do it, then the the caste Brahmins, the smarta Brahmins, they will say they never did it. They never did the proper ceremony. So, so in order to please them and to satisfy them, we do these things. But the actual installation of the deity is done by chanting the holy name. Because in the Kali Yuga, people, uh, they don't chant very mantras so well. So they do Frank Pratista. They, you know, they try. It's a rich, that's a ritual. But the real, the best method to invoke Krishna in the deity, to bring the life into the deity, is through the chanting of the holy name. So while we do the Frank Pratista, at that time also we do Kirtan. Why don't we put sari on Srimati Radharani and Gopi? Why do we put sari on Srimati Radharani? What do you want to put? Dhoti? <laughs> Why don't we put sari on Srimati Radharani? We put a uh, long dress and a uh, choli. <coughs> Oh, really? Why, why not well, sometimes we put sari. Not every time we put. They do also put sari. to children, you know, that they're not, they don't understand really the commitment and as they grow up, then they don't take that initiation so seriously. So, we're more cautious nowadays and in, 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 in ISKCON also they have regulations about initiation. Twelve is very young, actually. Um, 
very unusual for a 12-year-old person to be initiated. Guru Maharaj, in Gurukul they do something like Upanayanam and where they get sacred thread at a very young age. Can you explain a bit about that Guru Maharaj? That's the boys who are living in the Gurukula, in the ashram, in the Gurukula ashram. So they're given the Upanaya, they're given the, but they're not given the full Gayatri Mantra. They're just given the Brahma Gayatri Mantra to chant. It's just so that they can do things like puja and they offer, they do the yagya and they do also cooking because they're doing these different services. So in order to perform these services, they're first of all given the upanaya, they're given the sacred thread. But actually that's not fully authorized. Just something which happens within the Guru Kula. But do my question is related to the yesterday's literature uh, like lecture. Maharaj was mentioned about the three Garana Bhaktis, which is Sadhana Bhakti and Suprema Bhakti and Rama Bhakti. So a devotee who is trying to engage himself in Sadhana Bhakti, are they Qualified to take up the devotion, the Narayana Krishna worship. Oh, absolutely, yes. Even though we are not in Prima Bhakti, we are not in Prima Bhakti. You have to understand Prima Bhakti and Bhava Bhakti are very rare. Very, very rare. But I said that people may be doing sadhana bhakti, they are also pure devotees. There's very, very advanced devotees who are just doing sadhana bhakti, but they can be very, very advanced. And certainly, you can worship the deities. Krishna Guru Maharaj, related to the question about the Upanayanam thing, right, Guru Maharaj? What? When the, when the boys in Gurukul, they receive Upanayanam, is it... A, can you give your opinion, Guru Maharaj? Because when they take initiation again, they take under a different spiritual master. So Upanayanam is from a different person and then initiation is from a different person. So is this an... <laughs> I do not know. Like in the ancient days, was it under the same person? Do they get it all one shot? Yes. Previously, it would all be done under by one person. So what's happening in the Guru Kul is just some temporary arrangement for them to do some services. Guru uh, Maharaj, this uh, secret thread only wear by the men. The men. Uh, yes. Not women, right? What? The thread? Yes. Yeah, women don't put, they're not given a thread, no. Any specific reason? Well, that's just the daily culture, the, 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 the in the very culture, it's the brahmanas who wear the sacred thread. And the women are the wives of the brahman. But uh, the sacred thread is only given to the men, just like sannyas is only given to men. Women don't not supposed to take sannyas. And similarly, the Brahmana thread is only given to men. Women also, they complain, they said, we also want <laughs> the, the Gayatri Mantra, right? And so they went to Prabhupada and petitioned Prabhupada that we should get also Gayatri Mantra. Initially, Prabhupada was only giving the men. But the women also came and they were saying we also want to get Gai, we should also get Gayatri Mantra. So Prabhupada gave them the mantra. They let them chant the mantra, but no threat. Give them the Gayatri Mantra because they were also doing things like cooking and deity worship, you see. 
Actually, there's, there's always an ongoing debate within our society about the position of women, you know, what things women should be doing and what things they shouldn't be doing. And especially, of course, in, in India, it's quite, you know, it's different from like America. You know, in, in America, women and men, they're mixed everywhere. But in India, it's quite different. The women are centered. So, uh, anyway, Prabhupada, in order to facilitate the development of ISKCON, he accepted women and he initiated them and he also allowed them to chant the Gayatri Mantra and to do things. You know, certain temples you go to, like here in Malaysia, we don't usually have women on the altar and doing things like that. In India also you won't find too many places where the women are on the altar. But you go to the West, you'll see women doing the artists and the yeah. And that's just how it is. I mean even the the women some temples are the temple president, woman. So Prabhupada gave everyone a chance to do service for Krishna. But the, you know, there's always some debate about how much they should be doing. And where they should be and where they shouldn't be, and what they should do and what they shouldn't do. For example, in, in Prabhupada's time, there were no women on the GBC. GBC means the governing body which oversees the affairs of the ISKCON worldwide. So in Prabhupada's time, it was only men. But in recent times, some women have come here. And now the debate is whether or not women should be initiating, having women gurus. So that's also debatable. So one woman, they already approved one woman that she could initiate and she has done, she's done some initiation. So it's controversial. Maharaj, what about when, when there is a sannyasi, you know, there is a contention of women serving the sannyasi, is it, is it appropriate or is it an No, they're not supposed to. They're not supposed to say. But sometimes you're in a situation, like maybe, maybe you go to a doctor, maybe you have to, there's no male doctor, you know, yeah. Time and circumstance. Huh? Time and circumstance. Yeah, yeah. But the rule is sannyasi cannot be alone with a woman. Guru Maharaj, you can accept a woman as Siksha Gurus, right Guru Maharaj? Maybe not initiating, but no, we accept, accept them as Siksha Gurus, that's yes. right, right? Yes, that's right. The women, can, women are giving shiksha, they are giving, there are a number of ladies who are giving shiksha, so giving instruction. Mm -hmm. 